Well, good evening. It's time to start church. So we'll turn to page 348 and stand together. 348. Stand up. We'll sing it loud and proud. And wake up the neighboring churches. I must needs go home by the way. this evening service it's good to finish off the lord today here in the house of god and we trust you'll speak to our hearts one more time god before we go to our homes and god let us take whatever you have for us all through the week and let us use it and remind us again and again about how much we owe you and how much we uh, ought to praise you and thank you for all your good you've done to us in jesus name we pray amen all right you may be seated good to see everybody out again tonight do we have with us any First-time visitors, first-time visitors. I didn't see anybody that I thought was. All right, gentlemen, thank you for being ready. We appreciate it so very, very much. Uh, Junior, come on up and listen to that song. All right, 194. 194. Sing the wondrous love. Thank you for this beautiful spring day you've given us today. Yeah. And we thank you for this night hour when we come together in fellowship again. We just pray, Lord, for the service tonight. Bless the preacher. We pray, Lord, for the microphone to work good tonight. And we just pray for the whole service, Lord, and even the communion hour. Uh, bless the gift and the giving tonight, Lord, and just have your will and way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
favorite song. 331. He's probably watching online, so I'll say that. He's gritting his teeth at me right now. 331. Miss Donna Reeves is going to sing for us, and I'm sure this time. And then Pastor's going to preach. Each day is like heaven, 
Thank you, young lady. Thank you so much. First Kings chapter 20. First Kings chapter 20, and we're going to continue on in the life and times of old Elijah here and Elisha. First Kings chapter 20, beginning in verse 22. Uh, see, and we got all the demons out of my microphone today. Amen, amen. We're going we're gonna to see if we did. We had a great exorcism service here. And a lot of oil anointed. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself and mark and see that thou doest. For at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servants of the kings of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they, are, they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot and we will fight against them in the plain and surely we will be stronger than they and he hearkened to their voice and did so and it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to, do, uh, to fight against Israel and the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them and the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids but the Syrians filled the country. There came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said the Lord is, is God of the hills, and he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew the Syrians, a hundred thousand footmen in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek and to the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men that were left. And Benadad fled and came into the city and to an inner chamber. Father, help us preach tonight, and we'll praise you for it. And bless the uh, Lord's Supper tonight, too, God. Just let our hearts be ready for that. In, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, now we're preaching through the life and times of Elijah the prophet. And this is just really a side story. This has nothing to do with Elijah, unless Elijah is the prophet, and I don't think he is. Uh, but uh, you remember last time we preached here, Israel surprisingly defeated Syria. Now, I said surprisingly simply because if God wanted to kill wicked Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel, this would have been the perfect time to do it. And you would have thought he did it, but he chose not to do it because of all the promises he had already made to Israel itself. And so Ahab won the battle, and everybody was surprised, I guess, about the whole thing. Now, and uh, the Syrians were the ones that were defeated, and Syrians were the ones that were humiliated, and just as quick as they could. Is this is the microphone reverberating or something? No, it's good. <laughs> That's never been said before <laughs> in this church. Uh, and uh, I don't know what I was talking about, but anyway. Uh, uh, so he said the, the, the Syrians got their army back together. Now, now here's what, I don't know what would have happened other than, uh, at, at, this battle, uh, at this battle, but one thing happened. The Syrian general said, he is a god of the, of the hills. And uh, he is not a god of the plains. And the moment they thought that, the moment they said that, they were defeated. Did you know that? The moment that they had that thought cross their mind, they were defeated because as we read through the story, the prophet came back and said, because they said that you are going to defeat these, this wicked army of the Syrians. And so that's where our story takes off. By the way, a lot of Christian people are just like that. I, I think a lot of people are like that. Verse 23, it says, hey, God's the God of the, val uh, uh, of the mountains. And, and, and aren't we all just like that in a little bit of a way? 
when everything is good, when everything is sunny, when everything is rosy, boy, we're all ready to serve God and everything's happy. We're not going to, we'll do whatever we can. But, but let us get down in the valley. Let us get down in the valley. And here's what happens. We say, well, I, if that's the way you're going to treat me, I'm not going to come back to church. I'm not, I'm, if God, I'm not, uh, if you, that's what you think about me. And we could almost turn and curse God. And it's amazing how Christian people can be so uh, flip-floppy. I mean, we just one and then back and forth and back and forth with God. And oh boy, God, if everything's good, you're good and everything's good and I'm good and the whole world's good, but boy, let some little thing happen. And see how quickly some people will turn their back on God. Well, let's look at this tonight as we continue through the story. And we'll see what we can preach about tonight. And first of all, he says, uh, we read about the preparation of the people of God. Now, in verse 22, here's what happened. The, the old prophet came, and, the, and he came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself. He said, I want you to get ready because there's a battle coming. There's a battle coming. Now, you think about the last battle that they had. The last battle they had was a very unexpected thing. Uh, they, they didn't know all of a sudden this guy shows up on their doorstep and, and all, everything looks bleak and everything looks bad. They had no idea the Syrian army was coming. And so God shows up and he said, no, you're not going to defeat Israel. And Israel, God and Israel defeated the Syrian army. But now God says this, I want you to go strengthen yourself. Because he said, listen, there are times in our lives when the devil sneaks up on us. Amen. And God comes down and he helps us and we weren't expecting it. And the, uh, all of a sudden something happens and we're shaking in our boots. But God comes down and helps us. But now wait a minute. Don't expect that uh, all the time if you're not going to try to prepare yourself for those battles. You know what you're doing tonight? You say, well, preacher, I'm showing up for church, and I'm going to have fellowship, and I'm going to have the Lord's Supper, and we're going to have a little time, and then we're going to go home. No, what you're doing is you're preparing yourself. I don't know what's going to sink down in your bones. I don't know what's going to sink down in your blood tonight, but God's going to do something in your heart because you're here. And you know what you're really doing? You're just preparing for something that's coming up down the road in your life. And every church service you, do, you go to, it just prepares you. You're preparing yourself. And I hope nothing comes. I hope nothing happens. But the chances are your faith is going to be tried just down the road. And that's what God wants you to do. If, if an emergency comes up, I can promise you this. God's going to show up and going to help you. But he expects us to do our part. He expects us to prepare ourselves. And really, simply, that's what we're doing. Uh, 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 whatever may be on the horizon of our life, we're just preparing for it with a little Bible study tonight and a little bit of fellowship tonight. You're exercising your faith. You're, you're sitting here building a defense system. Some little thing may just stick with you enough. But God knows sometimes the devil's going to sneak up on But that doesn't excuse us. I say, well, if God's going to show up every time, I don't need to worry about a thing. No, no, we need to always, always be preparing ourselves for what is coming. Oh, no, they didn't have no warning last time. But this time God says, now, in a few days or a few months or whatever it is, he said they're coming again. And I want you to do something this time. I want you to get ready. It may not be much, but I want you to be prepared for this. Uh, no Bible reading that you ever do. Had you ever, you ever read the book of Numbers? Brother, somebody, Robbie was talking about this morning. You read the book of Numbers and you'll read your daily reading and you'll say there's three chapters. And you'll say this, that didn't do me a bit of good. <laughs> and you'll get over in First Chronicles and you'll say, that's like reading a Jewish phone book. <laughs> that didn't do me no good at all. Yes, it did. Bible reading is never a waste of time. You're preparing yourself. 
And any prayer you ever pray, is none of them is a waste of time. You say, well, God didn't answer me. You still talk with God, and you still got fellowship with God, and you still made yourself a better man or a better Christian because none of those things are a waste of time. And no church service is ever a waste of time. Well, now he says, uh, I want you to prepare yourself this time, King Ahab. I don't want you to, I'm, I'll help you, but I don't want you to just think that if you're not going to put your uh, uh, two cents in, you know what you're doing tonight? If you, how many of you got a savings account? Raise your hand. He said, boy, preach Yeah, give me your number now. Oh, no, never mind. You know what you're doing right now tonight? You're depositing, you, you're depositing in your spiritual savings account right now tonight. You're just putting a little of something aside. And it's going to come back and help you someday. Well, uh, 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 God's always glad to help us when we're weak or when we're surprised or when the devil sneaks up on us in our life. But he wants, in the meantime, for us now to be preparing. Uh, somebody said one time, he said, pray, pray like you don't believe in work. I like that. Pray like you don't believe in work, and then work like you don't believe in prayer. You see, you do your part. Uh, God says, I want you to pray, and so we pray. But now God says, now you go do something about your prayer life. Don't just stop right there. Uh, you, God, God bless me and strengthen me. Uh, then I go, uh, I get up from my praying, and I go and do all that I ask God to help me to do. Isn't that right? Here, here it is, here it is. I say, God, help me to win this. Help this man down the road to get saved. And we pray like that. We pray like that. I want him to be saved. And, all right, after you pray like that, and then get up and go witness to him. Yeah, that's what you do. That's how God works. You prepare yourself, and then you go do the work. And God help me to help me to uh, God help comfort that family that's struggling over. All right, you pray that pray. Then you get up, and then you go do your part after you pray. You're preparing. That's all you're doing. And that's what God wants you to do. You don't just leave it all there. You get up and you go do your part. Here comes the problem. Ahab, go do your part. And he did. It wasn't much. And what we do is not much. But God expects us to do it so we can be co-laborers with Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says about praying? He said, I want you to ask. Didn't he say to ask? And then he said, seek, didn't he? He said, then knock. He said, ask and seek and knock. He said, I want you to ask, but then I want you to seek too. I don't want you to just leave everything with me. I want you to go out and do something too. Watch how I'll work. God's always wanted that. And, and, and God help. Uh, so, see, what I'm doing is just pre preparing, preparing, preparing. I do my part in soul winning. I, I, I can't save anybody, but I can go. I can go. I can tell them the story. I can tell them they're lost. I can tell them how to be saved. I can't answer prayer, but I can go after I pray. I can't figure out the Bible. You know, did you ever read your Bible and say, I can't figure this? I can't. But you know what you can do? You can keep reading it until you do figure it out. That's the way God always meant for it to be. Always. So prepare yourself. Just like, this, just like this prophet told the king, he said, I want you to prepare yourself. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. Anything else, whenever we do anything else that's tempting God, you're testing God. You're trying God. So, so here, oh, let's just say this whole prophet came and he said, now, I want you to prepare yourself. And, and by the way, let's look at verse 22. I want to show you what it means. He said there, uh, uh, and the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, go strengthen thyself. He didn't say that last time. He didn't tell him to do that, this, uh, that last time. But he said, this time I want you to do your part. Do it. Prepare yourself. So we need to always be praying or preparing. And you know what the old prophet Amos said one time to all of us? Prepare to meet thy God. Life is ahead. Prepare. Troubles are ahead. Prepare. There's work ahead. Prepare right now. That's what you're doing. And God bless you for doing it. Jesus is coming. Prepare. Be ready. Get ready. Death is coming. Prepare. Are you ready? Are you ready? P prepare now. Ahab didn't know when Benadad was coming. Here comes this old prophet. Get ready. He's coming. Well, when's he coming? He didn't tell him. He just said, be ready. That's the same thing Jesus told us. I'm coming. Be ready. When you're coming, I'm not going to tell you. I just want you to be ready. 
get ready, said that prophet. And uh, that's what the preachers ought to be doing to every, uh, in every congregation, tell people Jesus is coming. We don't know when, but we're all just to be ready, always ready. Uh, he said, strengthen yourself. Uh, uh, see what thou doest. In other words, just pay attention, take heed, the Bible says. All right, so first of all, we see that he's getting ready. All right, now let's go on down to the next thing. Then he said this. Uh, they said that God is the God of the hills. Now, the Syrians were pagan, and they were superstitious people. They had idols and little gods, and they were very superstitious about everything. And uh, they didn't believe in our God. They didn't believe in one God. You know, they, uh, God the Father. They didn't believe in God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost. And uh, three in one. And you, by the way, do you know why God's, you know why that we don't have three gods? You know why we don't have God the Father? God, uh, we, we don't consider them all three different gods. Well, we do, but they're all one. Because you know what? One is enough for us. Amen. One. Three, three in one. Well, they, don't, they didn't believe like that. They had all kinds of weird superstitions, as many people still do. And uh, uh, God is the God of everything. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. And he's the Lord of the hills, and he's Lord of the valleys. Now, uh, let's talk about the valleys of life <clears throat> or the valleys that God talks about. And it's surprising to me how often God uses the valley when he's talking about uh, our lives. Uh, when we think about valleys, we think of uh, burdens, don't we? I mean, that's that's just automatic. We always think about burdens. A preacher will preach, and he'll talk about the valleys of life, and the, we we know he's going to talk about the burdens, and we sing uh, uh, about those things. We think there'll be peace in the valley. You see, that's just our mind thinking. That's how we think about it, and we're thinking right too, by the way. Uh, and so, when a person thinks of the word valley scripturally, he thinks of going through a difficulty or a time of trial. And uh, we often say it, uh, but in every congregation of people, there's always, and I'll tell you what, even in this congregation tonight, do you know there are people in our church that are in a deep valley right now? All you got to do is look at the prayer list. It just keeps changing every week. People's names are added to it. And you know what those people are? Some of our people are in the valley. They got difficulties and they're trying. I'm not saying they gave up or anything like that. I'm just telling you, never time you ever preach if you preach to people with a broken heart you'll have a congregation every time you preach and there are people who are struggling so there are people right now in this congregation people who are in the valley but there's a lot of people in this church that have just gotten out of, out of the valley. They, they've just been through it. They've already been through that experience. They had some hard time. They went through it. They, they're coming up, they come up the other side. God blessed them. God watched over. You talk to them. They'll say, Preacher, I don't know how we would have made it had it not been for the Lord helping us. And they're coming out of the valley. But let me tell you this. One more thing. There are a lot of people about ready to go into a valley. And that may be us. And so when God talks about the valley, he's always talking about burdens and difficulties in people's lives. And so uh, the Bible talks about the, the, uh, the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. Now everybody reads, everybody reads that and they think about that. They said, boy, we, uh, we, we use it at funerals all the time. We use that 23rd Psalm when we preach so often. But uh, we, we use that as individuals that die. We say, well, there they are. They've gone through the valley of death. I don't think that's God talking about dead people. <clears throat> I think we use that wrong when we do it. I think what God is talking about there and who he's talking about, he's talking about the people that have lost somebody they love. They are walking in the valley. Those people that are left behind, that's who God's talking about, who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I've met them so long, so I've met them so often. No, no, all I meet them all the time, and they're walking through the shadow of death. They, they're walking along a casket. They're picking out a casket. They're picking out a place to bury somebody. They're going on in their life without somebody they love very much. They're walking in the valley of the shadow of death. But let me tell you something: God is the God of the valley. He'll be with you in those times. Do you know what's the funniest thing? God said, "I am nigh those with a broken heart." I am nigh those with a broken heart. I'm just right there. I'm right there. I'm right there for you. Did you know God said, I'm closer to you when you're in the valley than when, I, when you're not in the valley? Now, I don't know how that is. I don't know how that is. 
But he said, I'm not. He's just waiting for you to pray. He's waiting for you to say something to him. He's waiting for you to help you carry the burden that you're carrying. He's just waiting on us. He's a God of the valleys. Don't ever think he's not a God of the valleys. He's right there. He's closer to you in the valleys than he is when you're up on the hilltop. Now, it goes on. The Bible talks about a place called the Valley of Decision. The Valley of Decision. Every Sunday morning we come and we preach and there are people sitting there and they're in the valley of decision. They, uh, they, could, they could decide to give their heart to Christ or they could decide to go back and just face life on their own. Or, or they're in the valley of decision. Am I going to rededicate my life to Christ or am I just going to go on back uh, the way I'm living? Every week we're all got these decisions and they're valleys and sometimes God is trying to tell us I'm with you in those valleys and those decisions you have to make I want to help you I want to lead you I want to direct you I want you to listen to me when you got to make a big decision about your life the Bible talks about the valley of Achor I hope some of you remember that I know you will in Joshua 7 that's where that old old Achan uh, uh, Achan sinned and he got off in sin he stole the Babylonian garment and the wedges of silver you know when he hid him in his tent he was in the valley of Achor you ever get off in sin don't raise your hand you don't have to because we all do We all get off in that valley and get down and we get away from God. How in the world do we ever do it? I don't have any idea, but we'll do it every time. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. We're just so apt to do it. So weak in the flesh. But even then in that valley there, in that valley of sin, if we'll confess our sins, Jesus will forgive us and cleanse us from all sins. He's ready, right, always to do that. He, you see, I'm telling you this. He is a God of the valleys. Don't think he's just a God up on the mountaintops. He's with you all the time. He's in with you all these valleys. And the Bible talks about David in First Samuel chapter 17 when he's in the valley facing the giant. There's a mountain on this side and a mountain on that side. And there was David and Goliath down there in that little valley. And there they were fighting. David throwing his rocks and the slings. There's so many giants that we face along the way. I think about Gary Snow. I hope you're praying for Gary. I went to see him yesterday. He couldn't talk. His wife, dear good sweet wife, was there trying to help him all she could. Doctors have gone and said that we've done all we can do. He's in the valley. He's fighting a giant, and so is she. We know when he dies, he's going to heaven. Thank God for that. They've got that hope. There's so many giants that we have to face along the way. Can I tell you something? Whatever giant you're facing, there's a God right there with you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. I don't care what you're going through. You see, what they said was wrong. It was totally wrong. And any time a Christian says that he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, God is always there with us. Uh, all right, and then, then you read this verse, uh, and you, uh, you read these verses here, and uh, you look at Syria's army. Now, it's an amazing thing to read it. I don't have a lot of time to spend on it. I want to get up to the Lord's Supper as quickly as I can. But, and uh, uh, in, all, in the last battle that they had had, we, we read it about a couple, three weeks ago. And I mean, God just came in and destroyed that army of Benedict. He just wiped them out one after another, wiped them out. And now, how powerful this enemy was because the Bible says, Oh, Benedict said, For every horse we lost, we're going to give you another horse. For every chariot you lost, we're going to replace with another chariot. With every soldier that was lost, we're going to give you another soldier. Oh, I mean, what a powerful, powerful enemy that they had. And so do you, dear friend. It seems like we'll get over one hump and the devil will send us another one, won't he? Will we just finally get victory over one thing and then we've got to fight something else? And boy, I wonder how Israel must have felt. Look at verse 27. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children, now watch, the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. 
Now that was the odds. And that was the battle that was before him. Two little flocks of kids. And sometimes the odds may seem like they are against us. But you've got to always remember that God is on your side. And if God is on your side, you cannot lose. Whatever you are facing right now, God is with you. And you're going to win no matter what. You're going to come up on the winning side. Uh, whatever you're facing, God is going to face it with you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Once over in the book of Luke, chapter 12, it says this, Fear not. Jesus said to his little disciples there, he said, Fear not, little flock. That's what he called them. Fear not, little flock. That's what Jesus told his disciples. Just don't be afraid. Don't worry about how the odds are. You don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know the enemy looks, boy, doesn't, the, doesn't this world look evil anymore? Wow. I mean, doesn't it look far more wicked than it did 25 years ago? Oh, my goodness. It sure does. You know what the message is from me, from God to you? Fear not. I don't care what it looks like. Don't be afraid. Sometimes I feel like the odds are up against us. And the, and the Syrians filled up the whole countryside. But God still was there with the children of Israel. Can I just say in preaching tonight, America has the greatest army I think that we've ever had. I do. I believe we've, had, we've got the greatest Air Force. We've got the greatest Navy. We've got all the great. But the, you know what? The worst thing that could ever happen to America is if we turn our back on God. It wouldn't matter what kind of army we had. It just mattered. It just, it just, and, and I think God's still yet on our side. I praise the Lord for that. I thank the Lord for that. I, I mean, I, I, we've got the greatest technology and the greatest tanks and the greatest battleships and greatest jets and cannons and all those things and got the best military minds, but all those things will be of naught if God's not on our side. You ask the Syrian army. You ask the Syrian army. They'll be the first ones to tell you. Well, Ahab looked around in verse 28, and there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Well, see, there's one great difference in those two armies. God was on one side and he wasn't on the other. And we know who won the battle because we read about it there. Well, Ahab defeats again now the Syrians, and uh, just like the man of God said that was going to happen. So you see, there was victory in the valley, and there can be victory in the valley for you too if you'll just go the right direction with God. Whatever's going on in your life, I don't care whatever it is, just keep doing the right thing. You know, so many often, they'll get something will happen, they'll say, I'm going to quit going to church. And that's the worst thing you could do. Through it all, just, you just keep doing the right thing. And all through your life, you just say, I'm going to do what's right. I don't care what looks like outside. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what's going on. I'm just going to keep doing the right thing. And if you'll do that, you won't go far wrong in your life. I promise you that. Let's all stand and bow our head, and we're going to give an invitation. We're going to have a baptism tonight, are we? All right. God bless you, Kevin. Come on up here. You stand up, and we're going to give an invitation for you who want to come and talk to God tonight. And God bless you. We appreciate you so very, very much. Father, would you have your way in every heart? I don't know what you've spoken about to the hearts of people, but people need to come. We always need to talk to you. We always need to tell you about our struggles and our troubles. Bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Mike, what page are we going to sing tonight? Was that too fast for you? Just saying something, it don't matter. 246. 246 in your songbook. As Mike leads us, you sing along or you slip out of your place and come on down and pray. God bless you. God bless you, brother. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And in sinners' blood beneath. to see that fountain here.
respect, you can be seated, please, and we'll turn over to 109, and we'll sing a verse of song until pastor and ready to baptize. 109. says amen at the same time. <laughs> Better say it quick. <laughs> Kevin, is it your testimony before God and all these that are here tonight that you've trusted Christ as your Savior the best you know how to do? Yes, sir. Are you going to amen. walk in newness of life for the rest of this time? God bless you, Kevin. On the profession of your faith now, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Hold on to Mom. There you go. Perfect, baby. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Woo! Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. I think I'll just let you be seated still. We'll turn over to 523. Well, we sing victory in Jesus after a good baptism. So victory in Jesus, if you need the words, 523. Cleansing blood. 